Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Herbert Marshall in What Price Freedom. Later in our program, we will bring you a personal message from Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau. Before beginning our play this evening, we'd like to tell you how easy it is to make your car look new. DuPont recommends any one of three methods. Number seven polish will clean away all traffic film and restore the color and luster. Or you can use DuPont Speedy Wax if the finish is fairly new and not badly weathered. However, to get the most protection and the longest lasting luster, clean the finish first with DuPont Duco Cleaner and then polish it with Duco Wax. Each method is safe, quick, and gives excellent results. And now our play, What Price Freedom? War is more than an army in the winning or losing of battles. War is a projection into action of the will and belief and unity of all the people. The American army is the American people. Its strength stems from one source, the strength and determination of our fight at home. Tonight, the DuPont Cavalcade brings you a story from another war, the War of the American Revolution, from a period in that war, the winter of 1781, when victory and freedom were almost lost not on a battlefield, but in the wavering faith of the people. A story written by Halstead Wells, which tells how, largely through the efforts of one man, that vital faith of the people in their nation was restored, even before the nation had been born. DuPont presents Herbert Marshall as Robert Morris in What Price Freedom? on the Cavalcade of America. Robert, I've always loved this field. The best glimpse of our home. It is a good home, and it's good to be living in it for a change. Yes, it's been almost like another honeymoon. And nothing's going to stop this one. John, as yes, Mr. Morris, will you let us out of the front door and take the horses right in? They'll take cold in this weather. I'll up and down, Mr. Morris, right away. Oh, okay. Here, there. Let me help you, dear. And we'll have tea alone. Well, I don't think there'll be anyone else. The children are sledding. Oh, isn't this lovely? It's snowing again. Well, we're back, Sally. Is tea ready? Yes, ma'am. And there's some gentlemen to see Mr. Morris, and Mr. Hancock, and a Mr. Jay, and a Mr. Griffin. Oh, the end of the honeymoon. Gentlemen from the Congress. Nonsense, Mary. I'll see what they want, but I'm a free man, and I'm going to stay that way. Are they in the library, Sally? Yes, Mr. Morris. I'll get rid of them quickly, Mary. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, if I'd known I was having such distinguished visitors. This isn't exactly a visit, Mr. Morris. No? Well, uh, Mary is seeing about tea for us. We're in something of a hurry, Mr. Morris. You see, Mr. Morris, the Congress has decided to appoint a superintendent of finance. Yes? You know the situation we face. The British no longer count on a military victory, but on our financial collapse. And they know it will happen soon, that the country faces bankruptcy. Yes, I know. And the Congress feels that only a strong man, a man the people trust, can save the situation as superintendent of finance. Yes. And so we three were appointed a committee to ask you to take the position. Oh, I see. No, I can't do it, gentlemen. Oh, but Mr. Morris... I can't organize the finances of a nation, gentlemen, unless I first have a nation. Sir? This isn't a nation. This is a hodgepodge of selfish communities called states. Each refusing to pay taxes is another benefit. That's true. We're all locked apart in blind isolation. And no one will lend a penny to the government. But that's why we need a man who can see beyond his own purse. We need a nation that can see beyond its own purse. For if we lose the war, we'll lose our purse altogether. We'll lose everything. And that, sir, should be your first speech as superintendent of finance. That has been my speech for four terms in Congress, Mr. J. If you would just keep trying. No, crying in the wilderness has no music for me. That's what I've been doing until I've lost my voice, lost my heart. And lost most of your money. It's more the time than the money. But if you only knew how people looked to you... If I only had faith that people could be begged, badgered, driven into a commonwealth, then I would give up everything for it. But these years have left me no faith. Talk it over with your wife, Mr. Morris, and then... my wife is one reason why I decline. I'm not young. In the years left me, I should like a few leisured moments with her and my children. No, I... Mr. Morris, the Finance Committee meets tomorrow night. 
couldn't you come and at least... Uh, I really see no purpose, gentlemen. At least uh, think about it until then. Well, uh... Oh, you gentlemen aren't leaving. He will be here in a moment. Well, thanks, sir. Uh, we're sorry to say no, Mrs. Morris. We finished our business with your husband, and uh, there's a meeting in the city. Oh, I'm sorry. It's so nice having visitors these days now that Robert isn't working hard. I'd hoped we were going to have a pleasant tea together. Another day, Mrs. Morris. Well, please do come, all of you. We will, indeed. Then uh, you'll think it over, Mr. Morris? Yes, I, I'll think it over, at least that. Well, we'll hope to see you tomorrow night, Mr. Morris. Sir. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Goodbye, Morris. Goodbye. 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 Well, dear, tea alone... Yes, Mary. Robert, you seem tired suddenly. Are you? No, no, just thinking. What is it, dear? What did they want? Congress wants me to be superintendent of finance. They were a committee. Oh. Naturally, I, I said no. Oh, did you? Of course. Only an insane man would take such a responsibility at a time like this. It'll be ruinous. I suppose it's terribly important. But how can I? No, no, I suppose you can. All those years of my life I've given to the public... No, I want time for myself. Is that selfish? Of course not. Dear. A man has a right to attend to his own affairs. That's true. And to spend an evening with his family. Mary, you don't think I should... Not if you believe you shouldn't. Think of the money I've already given, and the years. Has anyone in Philadelphia given more? I know of no one, Robert. Then, come here. Sit here on the sofa with me, and we'll forget all about it. All right, Robert. You know, Mary... These last few weeks of leisure have made me realize all over again what a fortunate man I am. Yes, Robert? In every way. Children, this house we built. But most of all in the years I've had with you, Mary. They've been happy, yes? Yes. With every kind of disaster raging outside, only this has been sure. Our happiness together. Robert. Yes, dear? Before I came in just now, I stood outside a moment and I heard you say something. What was that? I heard you say that if we lose the war, we'll lose everything. Well... My dear, it isn't possible that we'd lose this, too, our happiness together. Where do you want me to drive you, Mr. Morris? Oh, I thought I'd spend the morning enjoying the weather. Just drive, John. Well, not like you, sir. How's that, John? Well, to begin with, sir, it's not good weather. It is cold. Then, uh, well, I've been with you a good many years. I've never known you to waste time. Ah, but I'm vacationing, John. I'm a free man. I know, but uh, I always thought that you even worked vacationing. <laughs> do I? Well, I tell you, John, I want to drive because I have some thinking to do. Better stop at the side, John. Let that wagon pass. All right, Mr. Morris. Too bloody narrow, these streets. Oh, well then. That's a big load he has there. Thank you, mister, for moving over. Whoa! Oh, oh. Say, mister, do you want to buy this load of wood? Don't need it, thank you. Hard and dry it is. Burn like tinder. What's that you have there? Cordwood? Uh, yes, ma'am. Good hickory. Well, that's what I've been looking for. Are you aiming to sell? Oh, what's your offer? $200. Hard money? No, continental. Ma'am, if you fill my wagon with continental dollars, I wouldn't take it for wood. Wood burns better. I need wood. My man can't shop. He's dead from the war. My children are sick in a cold house for a month. Haven't you any silver plates swapped for the wood? My silver's swapped already. Or jewelry? I haven't anything. Anything at all. Uh, don't blame me, ma'am. Blame Congress for bad money. Well, good day. Good day, mister. Good day. Oh. All right, Mr. Morris. Yes, go ahead. Mister, what do you think? Isn't there anybody smart enough to fix the money of this country so folks won't freeze to death? I don't know, ma'am. I don't know. John, isn't that a child ahead? Yes, Mr. Morris. Boy. Strange. Yes, in this weather. I'm out here in the field. Stop, John. Maybe we can take him somewhere. All right, Miss Morris. Oh, okay. Hello there. Are you going our way? No, sir. I'm going down to the shore. Bad weather? Yes, sir. There's no fishing in this weather. No, sir. I'm going down to boil salt, sir. Boil salt? Yes, sir. We haven't any at home, and there's no buying it with rag money, so I boil seawater for it. If I boil a lot, we can use the salt for money. <laughs> Mr. 
It's uh, kind of you to give me a ride, sir. My leg's bad. Wounded? Twice, sir. Were you visiting home? No, I'm... I'm going there now. Oh, I see. You're right. I'm a deserter. But I didn't think... I fought, sir, for four years. But I can't go on any longer. There are hundreds like me. Hundreds? I left my family, wanted to fight. My family's starving. So I'm... I'm going back to take care of them. You haven't been paid? Yes. Paper money. You know what that's worth. Well, it's supposed to be... Where my family is, it's more than a thousand paper dollars to buy one good Spanish silver one. If you can buy it at all. What kind of money is that? But if we lose the war... I can't help that, mister. I'd starve myself. Did at Valley Forge. But Congress has to do something. I can't have my children starve. Tell me, mister. Wouldn't you desert, too? I don't know, soldier. Maybe I already have. Oh, Robert, you're home early. And I've planned a wonderful evening. Have you, dear? Well, there'll be a good dinner for change. Portraits and rice. Mm -hmm, That sounds good. And the children want to play music for you afterwards. They do? Robert, have you heard what I've been saying? Mary, I won't be staying at home this evening. You won't? I'm going to the city, to the meeting. Then you're going to accept? Yes, Mary, I'm going to be superintendent of finance. Oh, Robert. You won't mind, Mary. Maybe soon we can... Mind? No, I don't mind. You understand, Mary. I didn't ask for this appointment. And I know it's dangerous. I have to fight all kinds of interests. My reputation may suffer, but I have to try. I have to try to give the people enough faith in the nation so they will lend their money, knowing that war takes money. Do you understand? Yes, Robert, I understand. And I'm very happy. Listening to Herbert Marshall as Robert Morris in What Price Freedom on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. One of the DuPont better things is Lucite methyl methacrylate plastic, now being used for transparent bomber noses, airfield landing light lenses, and compass parts for tanks. Tonight's Cavalcade is a story about the darkest days of the American Revolution. After five years of war with people refusing to pay taxes or lend money to the government, the financial collapse of this country was imminent. Congress asked Robert Morris to become superintendent of finance, and Morris accepted the job. Soon afterwards, Colonel Russell Babcock, an aide to General Washington, came to Philadelphia on a secret mission from the commander-in-chief. I came to see you, Mr. Morris, with a personal message from General Washington. Sit down, Colonel Babcock. I know your message. There's only one for me. I need money. Yes, that's right. Here's the letter from General Washington. Thank you. You're, uh, you're going to read it. I can scarcely bear to read it. But surely you... From anyone else, yes, I'd read it and feel a kind of bitter satisfaction that I could share my desperation. Is it the spring campaign? Yes. Uh, you see here on the map, the General's army is here between Peekskill and Kingsbridge. Yes, and the British hold New York. I see. But the British also have a strong force under Cornwallis at Yorktown, Virginia. So General Washington plans to skirt New York and strike south to Yorktown. That's a daring plan. It means marching the main army over 300 miles and swiftly. But the army won't fail, Mr. Morris, unless the superintendent of finance fails to provide the supplies. What supplies? This letter from the general has a list of what we will need. 300 barrels of flour, 300 barrels of salt meat, 10 hogshead of rum, boats for 6,000 men, a hundred head of cattle every week. Well, sir? Well, the general's requirements are clear, but how are these supplies to be procured? Well, I, I assume, sir, that you would buy them. Colonel, the cost of the war every month equals two million dollars. The total assets of the treasury equal three hundred thousand dollars. What's the answer? I don't know, sir. If I had the bank, the bank would be the answer, but the people won't subscribe to the bank. Then what is that? There is another chance. The French government. France may invest. I've written Dr. Franklin in Paris and told him to ask for a shipload of hard money. But it can't get here in time. Mr. Morris, it is imperative. Then that... there is the last and slimmest chance of all. And that? Congress, Colonel Babcock. Yes, I'll go to the Congress and tell them there's a war. Maybe they'd like to know. <laughs> Mr. 
Gentlemen, gentlemen. Mr. Morris, the superintendent of finance, asks your attention. Mr. Morris. Mr. President and members of Congress, the last time I came here, I presented a plan for a new national bank. But all attempts to create the bank have failed. I am waiting today for a loan from the government of France for a shipload of money. I still have hope that another government will have that faith in our nation which we have failed to have. Mr. President, Mr. Morris is impertinent. I am impertinent. Gentlemen, perhaps I am impertinent. But I have a heavy responsibility, and it weighs upon me. And today, we are on the eve of the most decisive campaign of this long and difficult war. That campaign must be supplied. I have written to the governors of each state, entreating their utmost efforts. And I beg you to join me in this appeal to your own respective states. Supplies must be obtained by loans or taxes. If not by loans, taxation is the only recourse. Mr. Morris, we're fighting this war against taxes. <laughs> Gentlemen, we are fighting this war for a commonwealth. How do you propose to collect taxes, Mr. Morris? Nobody has any money. <laughs> <laughs> that, sir, uh, is a complaint as old as taxation. That money is scarce. The fact is that men find money when they have a use for it. Hundreds today who cannot find money to pay for their liberty can find it to spend in the gratification of vanity, luxury, drunkenness, and debauchery. <laughs> Gentlemen, if we will not submit to the enemy, then we must carry on the war. If we carry on the war, we must have the means. And if we do not, do not provide them by law, they must be taken by force. War needs money. War must have money. This is logical. This is inexorable. Gentlemen, Godspeed. <laughs> Robert, dear, you look so terribly tired. I am, Mary. It's been a disheartening day. Oh, you must get rest, Robert. But there's a man waiting. He says he's a courier from General Washington. Oh, oh, I'll see him. Robert, did something happen? I heard today from Paris from Dr. Franklin. He didn't get the loan? No, he got it. Hard money totaling 2,500,000 leave. But the ship is five weeks overdue. Oh, but what could have happened? Sunk, maybe, or captured. And Washington is marching now. To Yorktown. Well, the courier, shouldn't you... Yes, yes, I'll see what he wants. Good evening. I'm Robert Morris. Evening, sir. My name is James Whitler. How do you do, Mr. Whitler? I'm one of the men who's driving the cattle down across Jersey. The ones you will have them brought down for Mr. Washington's army when he gets there. Oh, yes, I see. The cattle are on the way, aren't they? I was told... Yes, sir. They're on their way. But I came to tell you, sir, that they're starving. Starving? How? For want of pasture, sir. But what is Jersey but a pasture? I know, sir. But the farmers won't let them feed. In heaven's name, why not? Not unless they're paid by money. Big money they want, or the cattle can starve. War or no war. And most of those farmers have sons in the army. You told them what the cattle were for? Oh, yes, sir. Well, go back and tell them the government will pay them a fair price in due time. But if they don't make their pastures available, we will send troops to see that they do. Is that clear? Yes, sir. That's clear. Robert, Colonel Babcock just rode in. All right, dear. Tell him to come in. I'll be getting back, Mr. Morris. Get yourself something to eat before you leave. Well, thank you, Mr. Morris. I will, gladly. Now, come in, Colonel Babcock. You've been riding hard for three days, Mr. Morris. It's urgent. It's always urgent. Mr. Morris, General Washington gave the order to march for Yorktown. Well? But the army didn't march. All the men from Virginia were willing, but the northern soldiers wouldn't budge. They want money. A month's wages in silver. But we simply don't have it. The general begged and threatened. They won't move without money. But, but does Washington expect me to get the money? He can't move on Yorktown without it, sir. Well, all right. Go back to him. Let him promise the troops the money. When they reach Philadelphia, a month's hard pay. Lord, help us if we don't have it. Come in. Oh, it's you, John. You woke me. Isn't it early? Yes, sir, but there's news. Good news, sir. News? Yes, sir, the ship. There was a storm, but she's safe. Safe where? In Boston, sir. And the money's safe. Two and a half million leave. But in Boston. Well, it... Isn't that good, sir? But we need to have it here in Philadelphia. It must be here before the army arrives. Oh, I see. There must be some way. Tomorrow, I... sir. 
Yeah? I could go for it, sir. Bring it overland. So soon, do you think? Well, I'm a fast rider, sir. Yes, you are. But coming back, it's a whole shipload. I, I could get carts in Boston, sir. And drivers. I know Boston. I could get good men. Men I can trust, sir. It'll be a risk. What isn't, sir? You're right. When can you leave? Today, sir, if you write the letters I'll need. Right away, John. Bring me the pen there. I'll start now. <laughs> General Washington. Robert Morris. We've been waiting. You were fast coming to Philadelphia, sir. Well, there was an incentive for the men. Your good word. Well, I do have the money. I knew you wouldn't fail. We came close to failing. Is it ready to be distributed? All ready, sir. Would you announce it to the men? I think you should. I'd like to. Drummer, call the men and announce, Mr. Morris. Yes, sir. Superintendent of Finance. Uh, Soldier, the news you are waiting for. I have money for you. One month's pay in silver. <laughs> I hope soon to establish the currency of the nation so that in the future you will be paid regularly by establishing a national bank, a bank the people will trust and lend their money to. The money we have today is a loan from the government of France, but it is yours. And it will help you win a victory at Yorktown. <laughs> well, General Washington, a little silver. And it's like new blood in their veins. Mr. Morris, sir. Yes, my boy. I'm the drummer, sir, who announced you. I know. You have your pay already? Will you take it, sir? I take it? To put in your bank, sir. But, my boy, we don't have a bank yet. But you said if we'd invest... Everybody. That's true. Someone has to start. And until then, I'll know my money's safe. You'll know it? You'll really know it? Oh, yes, sir. With the government, what else could be safer? My boy, I was wrong just now. Wrong about what, Mr. Morris? We do have a bank. Yes, sir. The strongest bank of all. Yes, in spite of everything, we have your kind of faith. What could be sounder? My faith, sir? Yes. And out of it... We have a nation's future. Thank you, Herbert Marshall. Ladies and gentlemen, our star returns in just a few moments. Now here is Gain Whitman speaking for DuPont to tell us what science has done for the loneliest man in the world. All of us have thought many times since the war began of the loneliest man in the world, a flyer forced down at sea. On the rough water of the English Channel or far out on the South Pacific at this moment, some boy, his bullet-battered plane destroyed and sunk, is riding a life raft. How about that boy and his frail rubber boat? Will he reach safety? He has an excellent chance. Think what science has done for him. A pneumatic lifeboat is made of fabric impregnated and covered with neoprene, a chemical rubber developed by DuPont that makes it airtight so it floats and that protects it against salt water. In the fabric are pockets that hold the things the flyer needs on his lonely voyage. There's his food, given double protection against exposure and immersion by metal containers the contents of which are individually protected by moisture-proof cellophane. A cellulose sponge is provided to soak up the last few inches of seawater which remain in the raft after bailing. And the flyer in the lifeboat may catch fish with a nylon fishing line. We don't mean that every part of the life raft is a DuPont product, not by any means. But nearly everything in the raft does owe something to chemical science. For instance, drinking water is manufactured by dipping seawater into a bag and adding chemicals to remove the salt. Life rafts have covers made of a special rayon and nylon fabric. They can be used as a roof, as protection against sun or rain, or as a sail. The covers are chemically coated, blue on one side and bright orange on the other, so they can be used either as camouflage or to signal friendly planes. To help the men who are searching for him, the flyer can also toss a chemical compound overboard that will dye the sea a bright color and will shine at night. 
as a luminous phosphorescent spot on the water. The dye is carried in a small packet made from a synthetic resin-coated fabric. Some rafts carry a radio that sends out an automatic SOS signal. Its aerial is carried aloft by a neoprene balloon. Neoprene rather than rubber because neoprene resists sunshine. Also, the flyer has a reflector so he can use the sun's rays to signal in the daytime. All told, he has a far better chance of making his way to safety because of science because of the kind of chemical know-how that brings you DuPont's better things for a better living through chemistry. And here is Herbert Marshall, star of this evening's cavalcade. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It is my privilege to read a telegram from the Honorable Henry Morgenthau, Jr., Secretary of the Treasury, which he has sent to the cavalcade audience and which reads... I regret that the pressure of government affairs makes it impossible for me to speak to you directly, as I have wished and planned. But I have read with deep interest the play just presented. Today, as in the days of Robert Morris, the need is great and urgent. Our forebears stood then, in a sense, on the eve of an invasion. We have successfully passed that point, but only passed it. Final victory is yet to be achieved. Supreme effort becomes the order of the day. Effort that will reflect itself across the seas to our men, our kith and kin, who tonight fight and die for that victory. We have a continuing and increasing obligation to participate with them in the fullest measure. They need and must have our moral and material support for a sure victory and a decent and enduring peace. We at home can help provide that support by buying bonds and still more war bonds today and every day. Signed, Henry Morgan Thor, Jr., Secretary of the Treasury. Next Monday evening, Cavalcade presents Jose Ferrer, Everett Sloan, and Barbara Weeks in My Friend McNair. The unusual story of an American soldier on bleak Atu Island who heard the Liberty Bell ringing its message to him and the way this soldier influenced the lives of two people, the man who fought by his side and the woman whose husband was a prisoner of war. Cavalcade is pleased to remind this audience that Herbert Marshall appeared through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios, which this week celebrates 20 years of motion picture leadership. Tonight's Cavalcade music was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. This is James Bannon sending best wishes from Cavalcade sponsor, the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. Monday night is good listening on NBC. For your further pleasure, may we suggest that you stay tuned for the Firestone program, the Bell Telephone Hour, and information, please, which follow over most of these stations. The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.